to all of you and welcome to the side event that we've put together with Soka Gakkai International, Buddhist organization, the Quaker United Nations office, Quaker Earth Care Witness, Quaker in Britain, and the Friends World Committee for Consultation. In many ways, it's a kind of interfaith grounding. And what we wanted to do was put together something that focused on how ethical values could guide more successful and effective nationally determined contributions and climate policies. And to inform how those NDCs will have examples of positive pathways how ethical values can make for more buy-in and for more successful and sustainable climate policy. Before we move in, I'd like to just have a moment of silence. We've done this for the last couple of years, just to settle in, and in that moment of silence, could we remember who's not in the room? Nature, the poorest, the most vulnerable, those who are not yet unborn. Thank you. being here. We chose this title for several reasons. First, because ethical values deeply define the vision of our organizations, the why and what we do. And second, because increasingly, climate policies guided by ethical values are more likely to be experienced as fair and legitimate, as more beneficial to the communities, more protective of nature, more protective of the most vulnerable, and therefore embraced as successful. What ethical values mean to you may differ, and we're not here to argue about which ethical values are the best or the most important, but to hear from different people, myself with the Quaker United Nations as Lindsay, to hear from our panelists who come from different parts of work on climate action, and to hear what that means to them, and how it works into their work and examples of how it makes it more successful. But before we start, I'd like you to turn to your neighbor and I'd like you to ask your neighbor, what do you think ethical values means to you and how do you think it might help in climate policy? I'll just give you two minutes. Turn and say hello. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's wonderful, and we're going to have you, we're going to make sure that after everybody speaks, we have significant time for you to ask questions, to share any examples you have. We want this to be really participatory. But today we have a range of voices. In this room we have voices, expert voices on biodiversity and human rights protection, on agriculture and farming, on energy transformation, on concerns over techno-fix reliance on faith-based, and on youth. And for each of these panelists, we're asking them to speak for a shorter period so that we have time for your input. But for each of them, we've actually asked them a very similar question. What does ethical values mean to you? How do they help lead for more successful climate policies in your work? And what are some examples? So we're gonna start with them. Um, all of these people are very dear to me. <laughs> Um, and the first is Ashen, Ashenara Puri. I call her Puri Heads. And Puri and I first met in the IPCC. And Puri works for Swede Bio. It's a program for biodiversity and equitable development in harmony and nature at the Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University. She is leading the climate change and ecosystem thematic work theme Sweet Bio, focusing on intimate yet intricate link between biodiversity, climate change, and using human rights as an entry port. Puri, would you begin? Lindsay for the opportunity. Um, it's really lovely being here with all of you. 
Um, yeah, I'm going to start with what does the phrase ethical value mean to me? I'm going to go a little bit more personal here. Um, I'm from Indonesia and um, I'm half Balinese actually. So I, even though I did, I never actually lived from Bali and so I didn't grow up there, but my father and he, we always have a lot of discussions around the Balinese culture and also the kind of like the Hindu philosophy um, with me growing up. So one of the things that we discuss a lot is actually the concept of Trihita Kadana. I don't know if you have ever heard of that, but um, if I just try to translate it because it's from Sanskrit, um, I hope I'm not making a fatal mistake here, but it's... <laughs> But at least the way we discuss it, it's actually a three things um, that causes the creation of happiness and well-being. And these three things is actually about harmonious relationship with the deity. And then the second layer would be the harmonious relationship among human beings. And the third is harmonious relationship between human and nature. And the thing is like, because in our culture, we believe in reincarnation, um, so, you know, everything in the nature, it could be either our ancestor or even, you know, it will be our kids and our grandkids or great-grandkids. So we need to take care of them properly. So um, I found this concept really, really fascinating because it gets us to think about, you know, um, it, it talks about, um, you know, cultural values. It talks about, like, traditional knowledge. But it actually talks about already intergenerational like, equity because you're thinking about those who were, were not born yet. So yeah, I think I think that that kind of like discussions for years and years with my father. Um, that I, yeah, that, that's something that inspires me also working in my work now. And I think this is why. Um, as Lindsay uh, introduced me beforehand. Um, so I worked in the intersection of biodiversity and climate but using a human rights-based approach, actually. So, um, a human rights-based approach. So I started with that uh, sort of traditional values, my upbringing and so on. And I think what I really like about it is also, you know, hearing about the stories that my father told me about his family, so my grandfather, my great-grandfathers, what they have done in their past, and also the kind of their relationship with nature and the environment. Um, and then I came across a human rights-based approach, and a human rights-based approach for biodiversity, we see it, well, there's no kind of definition, really, um, like a negotiated definition, let's put it like that, um, but it's, a, it's something that furthers the realization of human rights through biodiversity actions by avoiding further harm to human rights and taking action based on principles of human rights and achieving improved human rights outcomes. Um, and I think that will be the same also for climate action. And um, so coming back to the story of my childhood, um, I, you know, like the different examples of, of how, for example, the, the Balinese traditional knowledge are dealing with the environment. It's their knowledge. It's their right to have their knowledge. It's, it's the traditional um, values and knowledge that they have, like for example, the way they manage water, the way they manage um, irrigation system. Um, and you can see that throughout the history of humanity, biological and cultural diversities have been inextricably connected. And indigenous peoples and local communities have developed deep ecological knowledge in their long histories of governing social ecological systems. And therefore, protecting their rights um, to this is is not only a requirement of international human rights law, but it's actually often the most strategic way to to approach um, to approach biodiversity conservation, and that's um, why, for example, Sweat Bio, where I'm working together with Sakagaka International, but also other um, organizations such as the Climate Dev Development Knowledge Network, um, Fokali, supported by the OHCHR and the Secretariat of the CBD, we are now embarking in a journey to, under to have a dialogue process with different actors to talk about how can we advance a human rights-based approach to biodiversity and climate action, that all of these actions can actually further 
the fulfillment, the protection, and the respect for human rights. Um, so, I'm not really sure about my time. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I think that this, thank you so much, so then I think the dialogue has been very, very interesting. So we had a first dialogue with um, the rights holders, so with women, with youth, with indigenous peoples and local communities, and we have been able to listen to so many stories about how a human rights-based approach can be can be applied in different ways. And what came out from that workshop, for example, um, it's again like how you know this this feeling of like please do like recognize the knowledge that they have that this could contribute actually in in um, in biodiversity and climate action um, and there are there are different ways to do that the locally led um, action the women led restoration projects for example in different areas the agroecology and um, there are just so many different interesting stories and even like I myself had a story from Bali again because my great grandfather apparently is the head of SUBA which is an organization owned by the farmers on Bali that specifically regulars water management or watering system or irrigation for the rice fields you know how participatory it is that basically it is deciding full participatory manner that the governance model is is owned traditionally but very very participatory and it's like really locally led and for me it's also a, an example of a human rights based approach and I think to recognize this to realize that there are so many things going on on the ground in a way that we can learn from them we can consider their approach and we can we can make sure their their rights to self determination, their rights to their own knowledge, their rights to the natural resources they very much depend on. I think I believe that is a way to move forward. Okay, so thank you so much. Thank you, Puri. Our next speaker is Esther Esther Panunia. And Esther is the Secretary General of the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development. It's a regional alliance of national farmers. It's an organization for focal FOs in Asia with 22 national FO. Esther, is that focal points for Secretary Generals in 16 countries representing around 13 million small-scale men, women, and young family farmers engaged in crops, livestock, fisheries, forestry, herding, and pastoralism. She is from the Philippines, and Esther is speaking on land, farming, agriculture as ethical values to ground successful climate policies. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, and good morning to everyone. I must confess that I I had some jitters you know, when, when uh, the organizers asked me to, to uh, have this focus on ethical values you know, because I've been speaking in, in several conferences but it's all about capacities, it's all about challenges and barriers and what you want the government to do. So, but here it's about ethics. No, and my, my colleague, who is here, said, oh, now in that session you will be Sister Esther. <laughs> <laughs> but reflecting on, on, the, on this topic, I, I was kind of realizing that my journey as a development worker and now as a weekend farmer, because I still have full-time work, that in my journey as a development worker, these ethic, ethical values have guided me in my work and what I will do. So I first Google the word ethics. No? And ethics means rules that help us tell the difference between right and wrong. And values mean what is important because uh, what is important will help you make decisions about right and wrong. Mm -hmm. So ethical values mean our individual's compass, guiding our actions and behaviors making decisions and evaluating our actions based on what we think is right and wrong. I have to make this premise to, to be able to go on. 
So with this, with this understanding of what ethical values mean, I came to realize, you know, what these ethical values I had now has started when I was very young. Because when I was very young, I had an uncle who lived with us, and he has this like a slogan, a poster in his room, which is about the golden rule. I think everyone knows about the golden rule: do not do unto others what you don't like others to do unto you. And then, as a young, uh, as a eldest child in the family of seven, I saw my parents, my parents, being very fair to everyone. Like if there is one slice of a uh, pie. It has to be divided equally among seven of us. Okay. If there's one piece of fish, it has to be equally divided amongst the seven of us children. And also, at that very early age, because I'm the eldest, I was taught the sense of responsibility. You are the eldest, we are poor, you have to study hard, so you have to graduate, and then you have to work so that you would help your siblings go to school and to university. That kind of responsibility. We will give you all the money you need you, know, you have that right and that privilege but do not make do not go into marriage at once <laughs> don't have a boyfriend study graduate work and help your children I like that so in college i was a social work prof uh, i graduate and in social work then i i went into eight years of community work and it was under a parish parish uh, priest and then i learned about peace and justice and it's peace and justice and the correlation justice brings peace there cannot be peace without justice so you have to promote justice so that you can have peace and also as persons we have rights like right to live but but corresponding to that rights our responsibilities we have the right to own the land but we have the responsibility to take care of this land so these are the ethical values that guided me now that I am like past 20 years now in development world. So what in APA, we are promoting four things while here, not in, in Bonn and in the UNFCCC processes. First, the right to land, the right to secure tenurial instruments of small-scale family farmers. Why? Because now we know that so very uh, so very little, so very few percentage of uh, people own big tracts of land. Okay? And family farmers like own only 12% of agriculture lands. And if family farmers, for example, produce 80% of the world's food, isn't there injustice in the way that lands are owned? Lands are owned by not us. We, many of our farmers are still landless. Many of our farmers are still struggling to have secured tenurial instruments in our farms and forests. In the fisheries, for example, we cannot go out. These commercial fishers can go out because they have big resources. They have the money to buy big boats to, to go out into the sea and catch more fishes. There is injustice there. So we cannot say to the to climate action we involve securing the rights of the farmers and the fishers and the forest dwellers and the pastoralists to their um, natural resources. Second, here in, 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 in climate change processes, we, want, we, we are talking about adaptation and mitigation. So we are promoting here sustainable, regenerative, agroecological approaches, as Puria said. Why? Because we, we, be, we, we believe, our ethical value believes that land is not ours. Land is God's. Nobody created land. It was there for us. And we have to use it not just for ourselves. We have to think of the future generation of our children and of our grandchildren. God has given us land so that we could manage it for ourselves so that we can have food, we can be healthy, but not only for us, but for our, our, our children and, great, and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So we must use sustainable approaches, which does not harm the environment, but rather protect, conserve, and promote, no, for example, the biodiversity. So that's why we are promoting, we say, in, in climate processes, agroecology, regenerative agriculture is the way to go, no, in terms of what kind of agriculture should we do. 
this, and then uh, um, corollary to sustainable agriculture is on on uh, markets, market power. So if we could see, for example, the uh, the farmers, one of their problems is mark, they decrease market power. We are just price takers. No, we cannot dictate the prices. So it's the middlemen, for example, who say what is the price. So we lose, for example, in 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 terms of in, in the negotiation. So we think. Uh, justice will be being able to negotiate better for our prices, to negotiate better contracts, for example, in contract warning and in lease uh, arrangements. So we are promoting cooperatives. We are saying in, in climate change and in, in our recommendations, please help us organize cooperatives to do value addition and the freedom to also negotiate for better prices for our products. And lastly, climate finance. Climate finance. So there is, of course, there is. We say little money for climate finance, but even if it's little, the big part, bulk of the climate finance does not go to farmers who are the most vulnerable and who provide solutions to climate adaptation with mitigation. Our research points out that only 0.3 percent of climate financing goes directly to family farmers. Isn't there injustice there? So that's why the, we don't have any peace. No, because we are very vulnerable, we are very much affected by climate change. We want to provide solutions on our own and have the freedom, but we need resources. So we need climate finance to us. And lastly, just one more, inclusivity. Isn't it there is injustice there? If, if we are not included in the decision-making processes relating to agriculture and climate when it's us being affected. So that's why here in, 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 in the negotiations, we want to really see the significant involvement of family farmers in the design, in the implementation, the monitoring and evaluation of climate projects and programs that will be funded specially by climate financing. So this is how we see myself as the ethical values of peace, justice, rights, and, and responsibilities come into play. So for NDCs, we hope that the NDCs will, will put land rights for farmers, sustainable agroecology, help in mainstreaming it, and also increase climate finance and include us in all the decisions relating to agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. And those calls are worldwide, and they are worldwide also here in Europe, where we've had many challenges of engaging with the farming community and coming from a farming extended family, supporting farmers and supporting them with finance to do the transitions and do it ethically and sustainably and regeneratively. And I want to thank you for highlighting that you can't have peace without justice as well. Our next speaker is Neil. Neil Grant, who spoke last year with us, and we roped him in again, bless him. Um, he's also in The Guardian often, so he's a bit famous, so I'm sitting next to him. Neil is a senior climate and energy analyst at Climate Analytics, where he analyzes 1.5 Celsius aligned fossil fuel phase out and renewables roll in pathways and tracks what countries would need to do at the national level to deliver the Paris Agreement's temperature goal. Neil is going to speak on energy transformations, and as you all know, on an ethical basis, this can be used in different ways, and it's really helpful to hear Neil talk about an ethical approach. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Lindsay. It's really great to be, be here at this event this year again. Um, and yeah, I'm going to speak a bit about uh, my experience in my work, which I, I really appreciate having this space because uh, as you might imagine, at an organization called Climate Analytics, my work normally is, is very quantitative and very numbers focused. And I think it's really important to have space to bring broader systems of knowledge and ethics into the discussion. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity. And I'll, I'll speak off the back of my work, but also uh, with the perspective of my faith tradition as a, a follower of the way of Jesus. Um, I think for me, what does ethical values mean? I also did so. I, I also googled it because I thought I, I'm not sure yeah. I know what it means. Um, but I think I think for me, ethical values are those values which are other focused. Uh, they're focused on the the well-being and flourishing of others, and 
I think particularly for me it's important to know that uh, the others that we're thinking of is a very wide constituency, you know, and in the call to, to love our neighbour, uh, you know, our neighbours are not just those in immediate contact with us, but our neighbours are all of humanity in this globally interconnected system, and also non-human life and the earth itself that we uh, are in relationship with. And to me, ethical values are those which are yeah, focused on respecting the well-being and flourishing of those others, and also seeking to work for the restoration of relationship uh, with each of those. Um, yeah, I found that really helpful, Puri, in your, uh, your remarks about, yeah, our relationship with God, our relationship with others, our relationship with the world, and I would say our relationship with ourselves, all of those are warped by the systems that we live in, and we have a chance uh, to think about how to reset and restore them. Um, and then we've been asked to talk about sort of how ethical values could influence effective climate policy. I think, to me, where I find eth ethics so important is helping to transform and inspire our imagination. So I guess you could say that my work is sort of in the imagination game. So what I do is you know, model possible future 1.5 aligned fossil fuel phase out pathways or renewables rolled in pathways. You know, and using modelling, try and produce scenarios of what could happen in the future. And, and something I reflect on is so often my imagination, and I think so often the dominant narrative that is sometimes maybe spoken about here, the, the imagination is often so poor mm, yes. for what we could do, what we could achieve, uh, what the earth and all life on it deserves. And I think ethics are really important in helping us expand that. And I'm going to give just two examples. So the first is around avoiding harm um, and the way that having a broader ethical lens around harm and where harm is done and, and to whom can expand our imagination. So the sort of modelling that I do is often quite narrow focused. It's CO2 minimisation modelling. How can we cut CO2 in the most effective or cheapest or most feasible way? And you know, that's really important because we know obviously uh, one of the, uh, the greatest harm that we are doing to ourselves and to all life on this planet is the pumping of CO2 into the atmosphere and the, the escalating impacts of the climate crisis. But that's not the only harm that we should be cognizant of. Uh, you know, there's the extreme harm that comes to local populations through fossil fuel extraction and also fossil fuel combustion. On the extraction side, often uh, particularly disproportionately affecting indigenous communities, um, and you know, if, we, if we account for that broader harm, actually we get very different uh, outcomes out. So an example of this was last year working on the production gap report, a focus on uh, the future fossil fuel pathways which would be aligned with uh, 1.5 degrees. We as, a, as an authorship, authorship team were able to argue, okay, here's what the models say. They say you know, cut by X percent by 2050, but actually, if we account for these broader harms, which these models often are not including, that only has an impact in one way, which is to give further evidence for the need for a rapid uh, and accelerated phase out of fossil fuels. Um, and I think, yeah, so I think that's, a, uh, that's one example of where having a broader uh, awareness, which I'm, I'm sure so many in this room do, but I still think we need to bring that into the climate policy discourse further. And then there's, there's the additional harms from the fossil economy, but there's also potential harms that we need to be aware of in the coming zero carbon economy. You know, I think um, others at this table will know much better than me the, the huge harms that a transition to large-scale biomass dependence would have on non-human life, but also on uh, so many uh, current users of land, a, a huge expansion of bioenergy, and again, so often in our modelling work, if we focus just on how do we cut CO2, we can uh, get a different perspective to how can we seek the flourishing of all. Uh, so I would say the modelling that I do is still a long way away from there, and that's why you know, models need, can only take you so far. Uh, but I think the more that we can expand our imagination of what we're trying to do, you know, we're in, we should be in the business of systems transformation, not emissions reduction. Emissions reduction is part of systems transformation, and I think ethical, uh, maintaining a broader ethical lens can help us there. 
the, uh, the second example, and I will be brief here because uh, I'm mindful of time, is about expanding our imagination around what the future power structures of a zero carbon world could look like. Um, so one of the things I do outside of my work at Climate Analytics is uh, back in London where I live, I'm part of uh, community energy groups. So we are trying to set up community-owned, decentralised solar power um, in different communities in London. And I think you know, that for me is part of living out ethical values because you know, the, again, the future that we should be fighting for cannot just be today's power structures with some solar panels added in. Um, you know, we we deserve better than that. We can imagine better than that. And again, I think you know, bringing an ethical lens of how what are the power structures of the current energy system? The current energy system you know, concentrates wealth and power in a very small number of people, while millions are either. Uh, driven into fuel poverty by high energy bills or priced out of energy access altogether. And actually, how can we imagine a future energy system which, yes, is zero carbon, I 100% need that, but is also decentralised and democratised and one where yeah, every, everyone, uh, all of those people whose flourishing we're seeking is brought into energy transition. Um, so yeah, those are a couple of examples, I think, of how bringing a broader ethical lens to climate policy can help uh, expand our imagination from emissions reduction to system transformation. Um, with that, I'll close. Thanks. I know that um, we organized this and brought the speakers together, but I just want to say how much already you're giving me energy to keep going um, and, and hope. And thank you for talking not only about the wider modeling and the realities and the ethical and the imagining and the real systems transformation, but also empowering local communities. Um, that's been really special. Our next speaker is Duncan McLaurin. And Duncan and Neil know each other, and I didn't know that, but uh, Duncan, I know Duncan, you know Duncan, um, because he helped you with your PhD. So here we have a connection. And Duncan has just also written a working paper for us on what he's about to speak. There are copies of the working paper outside. If you'd like a copy, we're getting some feed in from it. Um, Duncan is a research fellow at the Emmett Institute, UCLA, um, University of California, Los Angeles School of Law. His research explores the justice and political implications of novel technologies, including carbon removal. His recent work explores the geopolitics <coughs> of geo, excuse me, <coughs> the geopolitics of geoengineering and the governance of carbon removal techniques in the context of net zero policy goals. In his previous career, <clears throat> Duncan worked as an environmental researcher and campaigner, most recently as chief executive of Friends of the Earth Scotland from 2003 to 2011. Duncan is zooming in from the UK. Thanks very much, Lindsay, and it's a real pleasure to, to be joining you. I'm, I'm sad not to be there in the, the throes of the event and, and in the room to, to meet everyone personally, particularly here in those three presentations already that are all so inspiring. Um, so you asked us to start by talking about ethical values, and ethics to me means, I guess, two things. First is a duty to morally recognize all humans and other life. It seems to me that if we want to be recognized in that way by others ourselves, then we must have a duty to recognize others that way. And that's, a, a, in the jargon, a recognition-based ethic. But it reflects very strongly the African concept of Ubuntu, the idea that I am because you are. Not, I'm not an island, I am a person in a network of relationships. And secondly, building on that, I think ethics means to me that, that we need to take our collective choices in the interests of those who are least privileged and most vulnerable. So I want to start in thinking about ethical values and carbon removal by warning against moral corruption. So moral corruption is the, the tendency 
that people might have to take what is a personally easy and beneficial option and then find ways to justify it even when it displaces harms to others elsewhere or in the future. And the moral philosopher Steve Gardner has argued that moral corruption is, is rife in the climate space. It's the main reason why we have collectively as a, as a world not come to terms with the problem. And it's a particular risk with things we might call techno-fixes, the promise of a, a new technology that will make things easier in the future so that we don't have to take hard decisions now. And that applies, I think, very much to the idea of large-scale carbon removal. We're already seeing many rich world efforts to put effort, emphasis on to rely on carbon removal instead of making difficult, expensive or inconvenient emissions cuts. Oil companies and petrostates are leading the charge to claim that we, we need not phase out fossil fuels because carbon dioxide removal can eliminate the climate impacts. But as Neil was just pointing out, of course, it wouldn't count to the harms, the other harms of fossil fuel use. Millions of deaths from air pollution, contaminating land, and decimating nature, and conflicts, oh, violent conflicts over energy reserves. So critically, this means that, that we, and, and we is obviously a difficult term, <laughs> it's always unsure who we are, but we collectively must not be postponing emissions cuts because of expectations of future carbon removal. Now, some of you might think such a scenario implausible, but the economic models that are related to at least the ones um, Neil was just talking about, these integrated assessment models that uh, are widely used by policymakers to project possible climate pathways can be a very bad guide in this respect. Unless you reach into the model and tweak and hack a way to change them, they will automatically sacrifice apparently expensive near-term emissions cuts in favour of speculative future technology um, to the greatest extent that the model can do. And so, moreover, I think avoiding moral corruption means that any residual emissions, and there will be residual emissions, and we're not going to absolutely eliminate every last gram of carbon or methane or whatever, but any residual emissions that are counterbalanced by carbon removal at or after achieving net zero must be socially necessary, not just technically hard to abate. And in turn, this means market-based trading or offsetting is not a good tool to guide the de development and deployment of carbon removal. And you may think, What's, why is he saying there's a need for carbon removal? I think there is a need for carbon removal at small and sustainable scales because there are ethically right purposes for it. And that's to balance out the socially necessary residuals the ones that support small-scale farming lifestyles, the ones that support the needs of the poorest and the most vulnerable. And we are already at unsafe levels of atmospheric greenhouse gases. We are going to need to draw down those gases to safer level levels. And the only gas we really know how to remove from the atmosphere in any meaningful way is carbon dioxide. But that doesn't mean that any amount of carbon removal goes or that it's possible to scale it massively. Large-scale carbon dioxide removal is problematic also because it is uncertain and might never be delivered. And that means we'd be risking worse climate outcomes if its pursuit substitutes for emissions cuts. But it would also be, at large scale, a risk to sustainability, justice, and human rights. There is no large-scale CDR technique, carbon dioxide removal technique, foreseen that would not compete the limited land, 
water or energy resources, threatening food, water or energy security, especially for the poorest and those such as indigenous peoples who are most dependent on functioning ecosystems. This was true back in 2011 when I researched and published the first systematic review of what were then called negative emission technologies, and it remains true as far as I can see today. This means, and drawing to some conclusions here, to meet the right purposes without threatening such interests, states need to develop policies to promote just and sustainable human rights-based small-scale removals of types and models that are subject to free, prior, informed community consent that contribute to a just transition, benefit host communities, provide meaningful work, and protect nature. To wrap up, as I and a colleague Olaf Curry argue in the, the working paper that about um, be ethically guided, prioritise emission, seek to minimise the need for carbon removal, keep carbon removal goals and accounting separate from emissions reduction, and dedicate explicit additional rights-based support to appropriate carbon removal development. Thanks for your attention and look forward to the discussion. Ted, the copy of his paper is outside if you'd like one. Um, as many of you know, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their seventh cycle, they're already looking at a report on carbon capture storage and carbon dioxide removal. There is a great fight over actually rapidly reducing the root causes or trying to um, counter them with um, not actually transforming or system transformation of the root causes. So these are really important guidelines to come by. Um, we have two more speakers before questions. Um, our next speaker is Jamie Williams. Jamie is the Senior Policy Advisor for Poverty Reduction at the Islamic Relief Worldwide. He works in international programs and, is, and um, has, where they operate in 30 developing countries. He has lived and worked in Sudan, Mozambique, Yemen, Hungary, the Sultanate of Oman, Fiji Islands, Sri Lanka and Malaysia. He has worked in countries in East and West Africa, West, South and Southeast Asia and is currently based in Birmingham, UK, but has been in Cairo, Egypt for 36 years. Um, Jamie is our adaptation specialist and I've asked him to look at this angle for us. Thank you. Not a technology whiz for a start, but I've been everywhere, but nothing. Um, this session is to talk about the nationally determined contributions that countries are going to pledge uh, for the critical five years up to 2030. At COP28, countries agreed to assign these, align these plans with 1.5 degree limit. And to repeat what Secretary General Guattari said yesterday, 1.5 degrees is not a target, it's not a goal, it is a physical limit. The truth is, he said, the battle for 1.5 degrees will be won and lost in these 2020s under the watch of leaders today and the leaders being elected today and across the year. So, Putting the thoughts of the Secretary General aside, I've been asked to say what my, view, what my view is of ethical values. My experience in many countries is that there are ethical positions held amongst populations across the world. Among these are doing the right thing and being fair. Concepts of right and wrong, which are universally held, determine that we look after each other in the best way that we can, and that we preserve whatever possible peace, wherever possible peace between us, and that we serve the purpose of good by whatever lights we see the content of that concept. Everybody lives in a society where a substantial number of people adhere implicitly or explicitly to these conceptions of right. The second concept I draw your attention to in this discussion is fairness. The content of that ideal might vary in cultural contexts and is certainly apparent, 
especially in children and youth, the idea of everybody to their own. The test for many, uh, for many uh, of any action or political policy or law is, is it fair? I, I think uh, colleagues have already made uh, 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 an exercise of similar points to these uh, uh, during their talks. So I'd rather concentrate on the other pillars of philosophy, logic, reason and rationality, and especially metaphysics. I don't think there is any lack of rationality and reason in the climate debate. Scientists and, and scientists here have told us in detail what is happening, what is likely to happen, and what needs to be done. Nationally determined contributions are based on rational, rational analysis of risk and capacity, and identifying gaps and what needs to be done to close them. At these negotiations, there may be a lack of political will, and indeed moral compass, as Duncan was suggesting, but there's no shortage of logic. <coughs> My interest in these UNFCCC climate talks stems from the work that Islamic Relief does in, in those 30 countries that, uh, that um, Lindsay mentioned, where we help people adapt to climate breakdown. This adaptation strand is well served by ethical considerations. It's right that people are helped to adapt and fair that those most responsible for their situation should provide the means for their doing so. But there is another strand of... Ah, Mr. Buck, I'm reading this incidentally, I'm too nervous to speak uh, off, off script. Countries' nationally determined contributions don't have to include adaptation, but logic and reason suggest they should, and a vast majority of them do. But there's another strand of consciousness which I think becomes more important as the tasks ahead become more challenging. About 80% of the world adheres to some form of religion. As a faith-inspired organisation, Islamic Relief Worldwide manages to establish a special rapport with populations who are predominantly peoples of faith. We are not shy to encompass people's beliefs and spirituality in our interventions. We see the process of an adaptation, indeed, as, as to some extent, serving the preservation of these religious and cultural values. For us, religion and spirituality is an asset in building resilience, engendering community and communality. Religious structures provide a medium of communication and knowledge for reducing vulnerability. And this leads to my, my main point today. As George Michael sang, you've got to have faith. <laughs> Beyond the ethics and logic which provide the, need, the means, we need to believe. As an article of faith, we have to believe that collectively and individually we can limit the climate catastrophe to manageable proportions. Nationally determined contributions, in other words, national climate action plans, will determine, determine emissions for the coming years. We must, as an act of faith, include absolute emission reduction targets for 2030 and 2025. 2035. And this must extend to all sectors, all greenhouse gases, and the whole economy. And NDCs must put ethical values into practice, showing how countries will contribute to the global transitions essential to 1.5 degrees. We walk the path together, each contributing what they can towards global net zero by 2050. And as we follow that path, we must bring uh, along with us all our philosophy, ethics, logic, and metaphysics. This will make sure that the weak and the poor, the marginalized and most vulnerable, are equipped to adapt to the changes already baked in. And may God give us strength. Thank you. And um, sometimes, and I'm sure people ask you this, how do you keep going? And um, I think there's a lot of 
words describing along this panel. But thank you, Jamie, as well, to remind you that you, a faith, a faith, however it's grounded in yourself, that we have to do this and we can do this and we have to keep going. And the systems transformations are happening. Our last speaker, Lucy, Lucy Plummer. Lucy um, works as a consultant on youth engagement for Salka Kakai International, an international faith-based engaged in peace, culture, and education initiatives based on Buddhist principles. She is also an active member of Yungo, the Children and Youth Constituency Group here at the UNFCCC. And she is one of Yungo's researchers for the Youth Stock Take an initiative spearheaded by Yungo to assess the state of youth inclusion in global climate action and to embrace stakeholder accountability to youth inclusion in climate policy processes. The first youth stock take report was launched in COP28 and is available to read online. Lucy is our last speaker. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and to all the speakers, and thank you all for your remaining here. Um, for, yeah, for this entire presentation. Um, so in short, ethical values are the way that I can do my best to navigate a very violent world with courage, kindness and compassion. I've been I have been engaged in climate action for around three years now and bit by bit I have been unravelling the extent of the violence that underpins our world today. It feels to me that whichever aspect of our world we choose to look at, we can see violence. Whether that's the systems that underpin the food we eat today, the clothes we wear, the foods and other electrical devices we use, the way we are governed, there seems to be violence at the root of it all. I'm not specifically thinking about physical violence, although we have an abundance of that, but structural violence. It's Dr. Johan Gautung, who's the founder of the Peace Research Institute Oslo, and who sadly passed away in February this year, who said that structural violence refers to the social structure grinding out suffering and that hits people at the most vulnerable points, their basic needs, their rights. I think we can all agree, based on Dr. Gautung's definition, structural violence is a pervasive issue and, a modern, and one of modern society's major ills, robbing people of the joys of living. This violence is no more evident anywhere than in the case of climate change. In a way, we are all victims of structural violence. Some of us are categorically worse off than others. Indigenous peoples, children and youth, women, persons with disabilities. It's my firm belief that the struggles of climate change do not come from clashes in ideologies or ideas or even between differences of culture and traditions and religions that exist between people, but a struggle between violence and non-violence, both at the individual level and the collective level. Ethical values empower me on my journey to continually strive on the path of non-violence. The values I derive from my Buddhist faith enable me to keep working on polishing my own humanity and they encourage me to engage with the collective effort of individuals also struggling against the injustice of violence in all its varied forms and contribute in any tiny way that I can to the construction of a society that values life as the most precious treasure. Um, so moving on to what I'm really talking about today, which is um, intergenerational equity um, based on the perspective of youth inclusion. So I'm sure you've all heard of this term, uh, or this value, intergenerational equity. It's referenced in the Paris Agreement, and it has a broad meaning, which is based on the view that the pursuit of welfare by the current generation should not diminish opportunities for a good and decent life for succeeding generations. So I work in youth engagement and what I have noticed is that when there is a genuine appreciation for intergenerational equity, along with a resolve to commit to equity for the members of the younger generation, it can lead to youth engagement that is more meaningful and therefore more effective. 
Including young people for the sake of including young people is tokenism, as it is with other marginalized groups. Young people are rapidly becoming more empowered as political actors, and organizations and institutions are running out of places to hide when it comes to youth tokenism. Youth respond very positively, as do we all as humans, to ethical integrity, because it gives rise to genuine concern and sincerity. For youth inclusion, genuine appreciation for intergenerational equity can be the difference between tokenism and meaningful youth engagement, where young people have their voices heard and have access to opportunities that truly enable them to shape discussions and decision-making that directly impacts their future. As Lindsay said, in, my, in addition to my work with Sope Gakkai International, I participate in the international climate change processes through Yongo, which is the official children and youth constituency group. Last year, Yongo initiated the youth stocktake in parallel to the global stocktake as a means of assessing the state of youth inclusion in climate change processes. One aspect of the youth stocktake that I, um, one aspect of this youth stop take looked into youth inclusion by parties and we collected data on many different aspects including which policies young people are engaging in, including NDCs. Out of the 24 parties who completed our survey, 11 had included young people in their NDCs, so less than half. In terms of what the impact of youth inclusion has on the effectiveness of NDC climate policies, at the moment we just have qualitative data on it right now. So we asked how the party representatives feel young inc youth inclusion has enhanced their government's climate policy development processes. On a scale of one to five, 75% of parties responded with a rating of three or more, five being the highest. But I really wanted to share kind of a short anecdote which I heard from a young person from Nepal during the first COP that I attended, which was COP26 in Glasgow. And this youth was sharing about how youth were able to be part of the development of Nepal's set of ND, first set of NDCs. So this youth was part of a local youth climate group and they really wanted to be part of the development of uh, the NDCs and they reached out to their government um, but the government's response was that they don't have the resources to do a youth consultation. But the youth decided to do the consultation themselves anyway. So pooling all of their resources, their time, skills, finances, energy, they embarked on a three-month nationwide consultation, which included not only reaching out to youth to gather their views, but also to women, to indigenous communities and local communities living in the Himalaya villages. The youth collected all of their data into report, outlining their key proposals and submitted their report to the government. And credit to the Nepalese government because they did include some of the youth proposals into the NDCs. And Nepal went on to include some of the youth in their national delegation to COP the next year. So I'd like to share this example which always stays with me because it demonstrates so many of the amazing qualities and ethical values that youth bring to the climate space. So to sum up, applying intergenerational equity can help with youth engagement and youth inclusion to make it more meaningful and ensure that it goes beyond tokenism to give young people a real stake in their future. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. And um, I just am thinking about the structural violence that you spoke about um, and how much it in, is part of so much of what we're living in. And also thinking back at the power structures that Neil mentioned and the systems transformation and how you actually look at what are our future power stru structures. We have 15 minutes for questions. Um, I would like to just go straight into questions. I was going to have you talk to each other again, but I think you um, have gone through that, and I have a hand already raised. If I could take two questions and then bring it to our panel, and then please hold on to your next ones. Yes. 